everybody. Good to see you all. Uh, hey, welcome to Spring of Life Church. I'm Mike, and it's such a pleasure to be speaking again and uh, opening up the word of the Lord with all of you today. Thank you, Mike, for that wonderful intro. Completely realistic and uh, good expectations were set. It's, I love the Paul Washer example, actually. And it's a good thing I wrote the entire sermon for you, actually. So if you're not crying, and I'm watching your face and you're not crying today, brother, something is, something's wrong. Um, but either way, what are we talking about? What, what are we opening the word about today? Stewarding your abilities. And I called up Igor, uh, Pastor Igor, um, before I started preparations just to get a hang of what we're talking about because abilities is kind of a vague term there, kind of a general broad topic. And, uh, you, you know, Pastor Igor, he's, uh, he just had a baby, and with a tired voice, he says, Mike, I don't care what you talk about, just, I'm just kidding, of course, uh, he would never say that, um, but congratulations again, of course, on your baby, yeah, that's great, I know if he applauded before, but, well done, Igor, all you, <laughs> um, of course, the whole family, the whole family, Yana especially, um, and welcome, by the way, to anybody watching us online. Uh, it's great to be together through the internet or in person. Now, about what we talked about with Pastor Igor, actually, is we wanted to expand what the stewardship series is. We wanted to start expanding it outside of the church. You know, we're talking about stewarding your families and your finances, about how you donate to the church. We're going to talk about gifts of the Spirit within the church, about your time. But now we're kind of want to uh, go outside of the church, and how do we steward our abilities outside, uh, at our workplaces, in our schools, outside of the church? And but as far as much as I'm going to talk today about outside of the church, keep in mind I am. This is all about bringing, building up the church. At the end, it is all about building up the church. It's all about God. It's all about Christ, not just living. Uh, kind of good lives and being good people, but it is all about building up the church. So, uh, I like this parable. The parable that we're going over this whole entire time is the parable of the talents. It's in uh, Matthew and Luke, I believe. And you all know the parable of the talents. We speak about it every Sunday. But just to do a quick recap, you know, the master of the house, the Lord, some head honcho goes on a trip and he entrusts his money to his servants and he expects an investment. And when he returns, some servants get an investment and they make money. Other servants don't. One servant does not. He just keeps the money, uh, gives it back to the master, and the master calls him lazy and wicked. And I like this parable. Well, I find it interesting because in some of Jesus' parables, you know, we see God portrayed as this wonderful, good figure, like uh, the father in the prodigal son, right? It's the father is looking for the prodigal son, and when he sees him returning, he falls together with him and embraces him and uh, uh, welcomes him back home. That is like, yeah, that's God. That's the God I know. That's Jesus. That is a good parable. But in this parable about the parables, we see God portrayed as not a very nice person. And we get some of these parables like that, where it seems like the master of the house, when he leaves and entrusts the money to his servants, it seems like he's kind of mean. I mean, he comes back like, why would you expect them to double your money? Like, how is that? Like, you're not even working for it. You just expect them to make money for you, and then you take it all. That's what one of the servants says. You reap what you do not sow. You're not a good master. And, uh, but I think the point of that parable is, when Jesus says it, is to say this, that God will ask He's not, and the master in the story is actually, he blesses his servants with much more than he gave them in the first place. But our God will ask. He will come back and he will ask us, look, I gave you these gifts. These gifts were an investment. These gifts were an investment. I expect a return. And when I come back, he's going to ask. He's going to ask, what did you do with the abilities I gave you? What did you do with my investment? And he's not going to be nice about it either. He's going to be straightforward. <clears throat> How did you steward your abilities? And so, and by the way, when we do steward them well, the blessings that are going to come from that are going to outnumber anything we have here in this world. 
That is how that parable ends. So, as big as this topic is, as broad of a term as ability is, I, I wanted to narrow it down and look at you, uh, what the how and the where. What are we to steward? What abilities we are to steward? How we are to steward them? And where we are to steward them? And I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm just going to spoil the whole sermon for you right now, and I'm just going to tell you what we are to steward is our speech and our actions. Our speech and our actions. How we are to steward them is without grumbling and depending on the context of the situation. And where we are to steward them is everywhere. Okay? So our speech and actions without grumbling and uh, within the context of the situation, everywhere. That is what we're doing. So what are we stewarding? Our abilities. Let's open up 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. Okay, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Yes. Whoever serves, or whoever speaks, as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that everything in God in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion and forever and ever. Amen. So this is where we get whoever speaks and whoever serves. I'm not just making this up. Uh, so whoever speaks, most commentators agree when it says whoever speaks. They're talking about like sermons and in the church. But we're going to just take, you know, expanding our topics, right? We're expanding it. So we're going to talk about speaking everywhere. So our speech the Christian's speech, uh, Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And in Ephesians 4.29, when it says, Let no corrupting talk, I like that the word corrupting, it just means uh, rotten. Let no rotten talk come out. The, t- the, the kind of talk when we speak it, it, all, it not only comes out as rotten, it corrupts the person we're talking to. It's the type of talk that brings people down. And this is, this can be loud anger or quiet rumors. This can be just one word or an entire speech, something that will bring down those around us. And the Bible has a lot of crazy things to say about the tongue and about our speech, like in James talking about our tongue is from from hell, it's set on fire by hell. It is a world of fire, just completely demolishing the tongue because James is telling us how powerful our speech can be anywhere, not just in church. And we tend to sometimes use our speech to bring people down, and that's not, in, in a way, that's understandable. And let me explain. Uh, we tend to pe- bring people down through our speech when we feel like we're in danger, when we are afraid, most of the time it comes from a place of fear. Now, if you're afraid of losing your job, right? If you're afraid of losing your job to, uh, some, to somebody from your work, you are going to bring your coworkers down. You're going to talk in a way that belittles the coworkers and lift yourself up so that you have a better chance of keeping the job. And job is very important, right? Our careers are very important. Uh, If you're afraid of losing your place in church, maybe your social status in church, which is a real thing. I mean, come on, in any community, social ladder is just a thing we have to contend with. And if you're afraid of losing your relationships, how people perceive you in church, you're going to bring people down. You're going to bring others down to lift yourself up. And maybe not even consciously. This just can happen just naturally. I mean, if you're in school, right? If you go to school and you're afraid, everybody's afraid in school, all right? And if you're in school and you're afraid of losing your friends or losing how people perceive you, you're gonna, that's gonna turn into bullying. That's where bullying comes from. It's a place of fear, a place of danger. And Jesus tells us that what comes out of us is the thing that corrupts us. Not what goes in, but what comes out. So our speech is a state of our heart. And if we are afraid in our heart, then our speech will reflect that. But this is what Paul means when, we, when he says, 
not to let corrupting talk come out of our mouths because we should not be afraid anymore, right? There is no more place for fear in our hearts, no more place for fearing the loss of our social status, the loss of our job, the loss of our well-being. We're not afraid anymore, and so we cannot allow ourselves to talk down to others or to bring others down with our talk, whether it's through spreading rumors or just condescending. I mean, God tells us all the time throughout the Bible, Isaiah 41.10, Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not. And then in Joshua, be strong and courageous. And in Colossians chapter 4, 5 through 6, this is like the opposite of the Ephesians where it says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer each person. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Which is interesting because uh, salt prevents corruption. So when it says, don't let corrupting talk come out of you, Salt is going to prevent that. I don't know if Paul meant to do that, but it's uh, kind of a coincidence maybe there. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. Let our speech bring others up and encourage them instead of bringing them down. And I'm just going to bring you, give you one type of way that we can encourage each other, and that is through good compliments. And I know what you think. Compliments, they're kind of flimsy. Compliments are useless. Compliments are just something you say. No, those are bad compliments. Good compliments are thoughtful and humble and filled with faith. Good compliments come from a place of faith. And it is saying, instead of just saying, hey, you, you did good singing today. You sing good. Which is, hey, great. It's a great thing to say if you mean it. But you could say something like, hey, you're I see that your confidence on stage has been growing, and it's helping me worship better. Oh, that's, that's way better. Or instead of saying, hey, good work today. You did good at the job. The reports are done. I don't know. The, the house is built. Instead, say, hey, your work is nothing but quality, and it helps me to work better. And it inspires me to work better. Oh, that is an encouragement, are they? That is a speech that is seasoned with salt, and not just a random word. You know, we say, they say we, we talk like from 10,000 to 20,000 words per day. Of course, if not me, I speak like five words a day, and all of them righteous. Yeah, you too, Vlad, yeah. But, you know, s- most people speak 10,000 to 20,000 words, and, only, and less than half of those are actually have meaning. Most, far majority of those words are just filler. Like, yeah, kind of totally, but not really, you know? Yeah, no, yeah, uh, those kind of words. Those words that have meaning have the ability to bring people up or tear them down. And so we have to steward this gift. If you have been given the gift of communication, then God will ask about that. What did you say? Did you build up or did you tear down? What else do we do? We steward our speech. We make sure our speech is seasoned with salt. We steward our actions. That is the second thing. We steward. And how do we, which actions do we steward? Our actions of helping others. All right? Our actions of helping others. In 1 John chapter 3, 17 through 18, uh, he says, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And I know he says, don't love with words or speech, even though I just said a whole thing on, on our speech. But I think what John says here is, it means here is, do not only love with words, but love with your actions. And that is our ability to help others. Our ability to help people in church and at work and in schools everywhere. Uh, our ability, and we're not talking about spiritual gifts here, right? People like to People like to say, well, I don't have a gift for this, so I'm not going to do it. I don't have a spiritual gift of helping. Like, you look at the Good Samaritan parable, right? The Good Samaritan's traveling by. He sees a person in need, beaten up on the verge of dying, and he picks him up. He bandages his wounds, uh, takes him to a hospital, pays for him, and waits until he's recovered. Now, Good Samaritan could have said, I don't really have the spiritual gift of helping or Uh, hosting. I don't have the spiritual gift of words of wisdom. I don't even, I'm not, maybe that's what the first two priests thought. But the Good Samaritan didn't talk about gifts or talents. He had the ability. He had the ability to bandage that person up. So he did it. 
He had the donkey with him. He, so he put the dude on his donkey and went. He had money, so he paid for the guy. So if you have the ability to move today, then you can help others move. If you have the ability to drive your car or a car, then you can help someone else drive today. And if you have the ability to lift things, then you can help somebody else lift things. And on and on. If you have the ability, then you can help. And in, in an individual, individualistic society like ours, it's pretty hard to ask for help, I think. It's much easier to pay somebody to help you, and you don't have to ask anything. So if somebody comes up to you and asks for help, understand how big of a deal that is, and try to help others with your actions as much as you can. Now, how else do we steward our actions, or in what else do we steward our actions? It's helping others, and it's in working. Our actions in working. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, Paul says, Bondservants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward, you are serving the Lord Christ. Bond servants, obey your masters and do whatever you do, do it heartily. And he's not talking about serving in church here. All right? He's talking about work. And our work, our job, our careers, what we spend a big portion of our lives on is actually very important to our faith. It is. It is. Uh, I mean, work ethic is a reflection of our heart. Our work ethic is a reflection of our heart, just like our speech, just like our faith, okay? If, if we, uh, I'm not talking about our work ethic in the terms of like, grind set work. You know, I work 16 hours a day. I'm making big money. I'm making big moves. And I'll be working 16 hours a day. I'll work 20 if I can, because I'm on that grind. I'm on the grind set. Yeah. I'm not talking about that kind of work ethic, because that usually is all about money. And people like that are actually more liable to cut corners when they can. Um, I'm talking about work ethic in terms of how honest you are with your hours <laughs> on your time card. I'm um, talking about how honest you are with paying your employees or, or how hard you work on something, even if it's not for you, but for your boss who's away somewhere, who doesn't even care about the job you do, how well do you do that thing? Because even if, even if, you, do, if you don't do it well, right, and people know at work that you're a Christian, and they should know that you're a Christian. And they know that you're cutting corners. They know that you're adding time to your time card. They know that your work is eh, flimsy at best and you have to make up for it and with words. Then they'll, they'll think about that about other Christians. Those are the chances. So your work is extremely important to your faith and to the church. And so we have to steward that. We have to. Uh, so, what do we steward? Our speech. We speak with a seasoned speech, right? Seasoned with salt. Not to tear people down, but build people up. We steward our actions in helping others and in our work at our job. Now, how do we do it? Well, I want to talk about two things that can completely destroy any kind of good actions that we do or any kind of good speech that we can say. Now, how we do things is extremely important to God. You know, it's not just about what we do. You, you can do the most <clears throat> holy and amazing and righteous things in the world, but how you do it is what really matters even sometimes. I mean, two people will come to God, right, at judgment day, and they both have done the same amazing things, and God's going to tell one, come in, and the other one, I never knew you. That is the parable that Jesus said. So, one thing, one thing that can completely rob our speech and our actions of their power and of, of its good stewardship is grumbling. Grumbling. If we grumble, 
then it will uh, destroy whatever we're trying to do. Look, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a war warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Do everything without grumbling. And this makes sense because uh, let's say we try to speak well. Let's say we try to season our speech with salt, but we grumble at it. It's like somebody you really don't like getting that promotion or somebody you really don't like getting, doing really well on that project or uh, receiving that prize when you know you probably deserved it more and you have to come up to them and you're like, yeah, congrats, you did it, you deserve it. <sighs> That's the kind of grumbling that comes, uh, that destroys whatever you're trying to say. You saying congratulations to that person doesn't mean anything when you're actually grumbling about it, when you don't want to say it, and when you have to force yourself to say it, when you have to say it. I mean, the same thing goes for our actions, right? If we do actions with grumbling, then those actions become less and less useful the more it goes on. Say you invited me to, well, invited me, you told me to come and help you move. Uh, right, move apartments, move houses, whatever. And I show up, right, and the whole day I'm just like, oh, what are you carrying these things? Rocks, this is so heavy. My back hurts. You really, you really just got me a pizza. Mm, you think a pizza is going to make up for a day of labor? Gosh, well, how, how much longer do we have? Like, if I do that for eight hours, I doubt you're going to invite me again, right? You're gonna, I'd rather just do it myself. I'd rather pay somebody than to have to listen to Mike grumble the whole entire time he's trying to help. Do all things without grumbling so that you can be blameless and pure. And the less important the rule is, the less important the deed, the less big the deed, the nicer you have to be about it. I mean, if it's just a simple act of service, if you're grumbling about it, chances are it's going to really impact nobody and help nobody. So how do we do it? We've got to steward our speech and our actions without grumbling but also in a manner worthy of the context. And what that means is Romans chapter 12. That means in Romans chapter 12, verses 15 through 16, uh, he's talking about uh, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So you might think, isn't a Christian always supposed to be optimistic, right? Isn't a Christian always supposed to be happy, always supposed to come up and look at the bright side of things because we have salvation, we have the Lord, we have all these blessings. Aren't we always supposed to be happy? And that's not what Paul says here. He says we have to live in harmony, and if you're only one side of that coin, that will not bring harmony. And if anybody thinks Christians should only be always optimistic and happy and energetic, have obviously never read Ecclesiastes. And one look at that book, and uh, you're going to see. You're going to see why uh, Christians are not supposed to be only one of those. To live in harmony, you have to have both. You have to both be joyful when the time calls to be joyful, and you have to mourn or be sad, to put it simply, when the time calls to be sad. I mean, have you ever had a situation where you're just going through something, right? You're mourning. Maybe you lost something or someone, and it's just a tragic time. And somebody comes up to you and says, hey, cheer up. Cheer up. You got the Lord. In fact, you shouldn't even be sad. You have the Lord. Like, is that helpful? Is that at all helpful? That speech, that speech, those actions are uh, completely useless. Or if, say, you are having a good time, you know, some Christians don't believe in having a good time. Some Christians uh, think you should always be sad or calm, as uh, they say, and just like, okay, okay, yep, yep, this is very good. Happy birthday. You know, it's, uh, that's not very helpful. That's not very uh, good stewardship of that. You don't always have to be a ray of sunshine, and it's not our personal quest to cheer people up as Christians. Okay, but that also means you don't always mope around either. We have to speak and act in a manner worthy of the context of the situation where we are. 
So what do we steward? We steward our speech, we season it with salt, and we make sure to bring people up and not bring them down. What do we steward? We steward our actions in, uh, at our work, and we work diligently, and we help others in whatever we can. How do we do it? Well, we got to do it without grumbling. Grumbling is going to destroy any effectiveness it has, and we have to do it in a manner worthy of the context. And finally, where do we steward it? Where do we steward it, saints? Everywhere. Ah, everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. We steward it everywhere. Where do we steward our, where do we season our speech with salt? Where? Everywhere. everywhere. Not just in church. Where do we help people? Everywhere. All right, Mike, I get it. <laughs> uh, everywhere, yes. Where do, we, where do we not grumble? Just in church? No, we be, we be not grumbling everywhere. I don't know what the opposite of grumbling is, but it's not grumbling. Uh, we do it everywhere, not just in church, right? If, if Jesus, no, if, when Jesus comes back and he asks us, well, what did you do with your speech, with your ability to help people, with your ability to encourage others? Oh, Lord, I encourage people. Let me tell you, I got up on stage at church and I encouraged people. I got, got through, I helped people park. I worked uh, like however long it takes. I was in that lonely, sweaty booth in the back and I was helping people read the words and I was uh, helping. And it's like, oh, okay, so that was in church. The well, church was 3% of your life. I mean, that was, what did you do with the other 97%? It's like, Lord, why? Why do you care what I did with the other 90%? I'm in church. God's going to say, no, you have, you've lived most of your life at work, okay? That's just what goes for everybody. You live most of your life. What did you do at work? You spent so much time in school and studying. What did you do there with the abilities that I granted you? No, it's not just about church. And I hope when God sees us, he's not going to say, you wicked and lazy servant who only spent 3% of your time actually stewarding the abilities I gave you. You got to steward 100% of it. Well, a third of our life we sp spent sleeping, right? So we can't, I think we're excused from stewarding there, unless you talk in your sleep, in which case you have to praise the Lord. <laughs> Where do we steward these abilities? At work. At work, what do we got to do? We got to be diligent. At work, we got to work diligently. We got to be fair, and we have to find our fulfillment in the Lord. Like we just read in Colossians do it for the Lord. Work as if you're working for God, if you, as if you're working for Christ. Whatever it is you're doing in construction or in an office or a creative job or, any, or teaching people or, or saving people's lives, do it for God, not for your boss and not for people. Your speech at work, it has to be seasoned with salt. We cannot bring our coworkers down. We cannot co bring our managers and bosses down. We have to build them up. Let your speech be seasoned with salt in order so that the Lord may be praised. So that the Lord may be praised. With our actions, we help our coworkers. We help our partners. We help uh, our clients. We help our managers, which might be weird to hear in church. This is like completely not Christian talk, but look, we have to do it in there. We have to, do, we have to steward our abilities outside of church, otherwise... How are we going to build up the church? How are we going to bring in people? We have to do it. I hope you all aren't angry at me for speaking about things outside of the church here. At school, if you're not at work and if you're in school and college and high school, middle school, whatever, you have to be diligent. You have to learn well. You have to study well. And it's with your speech, it's so easy to conform in school, to talk like everybody else, to do things that everybody else does. But we cannot do that. We have a different identity. We have a different calling. Let us steward our speech well in school. Let's steward our actions. Everybody needs help in school. All right, everybody needs help in school. And there are so many people you could help in school. So be diligent and be helpful and speak well. Where else can we steward our abilities? Our hobbies, right? What are we doing when we're not at work or at school or with our families? What about our hobbies? I don't know how many people here have hobbies. But when you do things outside of all of those things, be diligent as well. Do it for the glory of God as well. As Colossians, again, whatever you do, 
do it as if for the Lord. And don't feel guilty about your hobbies, all right? Don't feel guilty that you're not being productive. I know in, uh, in our society, it's very uh, pushed that you be productive and that you make money and that you do something. Hey, if you work well, you got to rest well. I mean, that is a commandment for a reason that God tells us you have to rest. And so in your rest, in your hobbies, in whatever you do for fun or entertainment, do it well and let your speech be seasoned with salt and let your actions be helpful. Let it all be without grumbling and in a manner worthy of the context. Saints, the master has given us abilities. He's given us gifts, but they're not just gifts, they're investments. They're investments and, well, he's coming back soon and he expects a return. He does expect a return on his investment. Now, I don't know if we can double it, but we can at least make something with it. So if you spoke, he's going to ask, look, you, have, you, you spoke so many words in your life. You spoke so many words, what did you speak? How many people did you tear down or how many people did you bring up with your speech? Or if you did things through your actions, how did you do them? Did you help people or was it all for yourself? Now, how diligent were you at your work? How many corners did you cut? Or were you a good example of what a good steward is? And how did you do it? Without grumbling, out of context, just a constant ray of sunshine? Or were you thoughtful and humble and faithful in your stewardship? And where did you do it? Was it only in church? Was it only in your family? Was it only in your clan of friends? Or was it everywhere? Everywhere you went, you were a good steward with your speech and your actions. The Lord will ask, and we will answer, and he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come to the joy of your master. Amen. Let's pray. Amen.